Part two, chapter three of Lady Byron Vindicated, a history of the Byron controversy by Harriet Beecher Stowe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter three, part one, chronological summary of events. I have now fulfilled as conscientiously as possible the requests of those who feel they have a right to know exactly what was said in this interview it has been my object in doing this to place myself just where i should stand were i giving evidence under oath before a legal tribunal in my first published account there were given some smaller details of the story of no particular value to the main purpose of it which i received not from lady byron but from her confidential friend one of these was the account of her seeing lord byron's favourite spaniel lying at his door and the other was the scene of the parting the first was communicated to me before i ever saw lady byron and under these circumstances i was invited to meet her and had expressed my desire to do so because lord byron had been all my life an object of great interest to me i inquired what sort of person lady byron was my friend spoke of her with enthusiasm i then said but of course she never loved lord byron or she would not have left him the lady answered i can show you with what feelings she left him by relating this story and then followed the anecdote subsequently she also related to me the other story of the parting scene between lord and lady byron in regard to these two incidents my recollection is clear it will be observed by the reader that lady byron's conversation with me was simply for consultation on one point and that point whether she herself should publish the story before her death it was not therefore a complete history of all the events in their order but specimens of a few incidents and facts her object was not to prove her story to me nor to put me in possession of it with a view to my proving it but simply and briefly to show me what it was that i might judge as to the probable results of its publication at that time it therefore comprised primarily these points one an exact statement in so many words of the crime two a statement of the manner in which it was first forced on her attention by lord byron's words and actions including his admissions and defences of it three the admission of a period which she has ascribed his whole conduct to insanity four a reference to later positive evidences of guilt the existence of a child and mrs lee's subsequent repentance and here i have a word to say in reference to the alleged inaccuracies of my true story the dates that lady byron gave me on the memoranda did not relate either to the time of the first disclosure or the period when her doubts became certainties nor did her conversation touch either of these points and on a careful review of the latter i see clearly that it omitted dwelling upon anything which i might have been supposed to have learned from her already published statement i re-enclosed that paper to her from london and have never seen it since in writing my account which i designed to do in the most general terms i took for my guide miss martineau's published memoir of lady byron which has long stood uncontradicted before the public of which macmillan's london edition is now before me the reader is referred to page three sixteen which reads thus quote, she was born seventeen ninety two married in january eighteen fourteen returned to her father's house in eighteen sixteen died on may sixteenth eighteen sixty this makes her married life two years but we need not say that the date is inaccurate as lady byron was married in eighteen fifteen supposing lady byron's married life to have covered two years i could only reconcile its continuance for that length of time to her uncertainty as to his sanity to deceptions practised on her making her doubt at one time and believe at another and his keeping her in a general state of turmoil and confusion till at last he took the step of banishing her various other points taken from miss martineau have also been attacked as inaccuracies for example the number of executions in the house but these points though of no importance are substantially borne out by moore's statements 
this controversy unfortunately cannot be managed with the accuracy of a legal trial its course hitherto has rather resembled the course of a drawing-room scandal where every one freely throws in an assertion with or without proof in making out my narrative however i shall use only certain authentic sources some of which have for a long time been before the public and some of which have floated up from the waves of the recent controversy i consider as authentic sources moore's life of byron lady byron's own account of the separation published in eighteen thirty lady byron's statements to me in eighteen fifty six lord lindsay's communication giving an extract from lady anne bernard's diary and a copy of a letter from lady byron dated eighteen eighteen about three years after her marriage mrs mims testimony as given in the daily paper published at newcastle england and lady byron's letters as given recently in the late london quarterly all which documents appear to arrange themselves into a connected series from these then let us construct the story according to mrs mims account which is likely to be accurate the time spent by lord and lady byron in bridal visiting was three weeks at how nabby hall and six weeks at seaham when mrs mims quitted their service during this first period of three weeks lord byron's treatment of his wife as testified by the servant was such that she advised her young mistress to return to her parents and at one time lady byron had almost resolved to do so what the particulars of his conduct were the servant refuses to state being bound by a promise of silence to her mistress she however testifies to a warm friendship existing between lady byron and mrs lee in a manner which would lead us to feel that lady byron received and was received by lord byron's sister with the greatest affection lady byron herself says to lady anne bernard quote, i had heard that he was the best of brothers end quote and the inference is that she at an early period of her married life felt the greatest confidence in his sister and wished to have her with them as much as possible in lady anne's account this wish to have the sister with her was increased by lady byron's distress at her husband's attempts to corrupt her principles with regard to religion and marriage in moore's life volume three letter two seventeen lord byron writes from seaham to moore under date of march eighth sending a copy of his verses in lady byron's handwriting and saying quote, we shall leave this place to-morrow and shall stop on our way to town in the interval of taking a house there at colonel lee's near newmarket where any epistle of yours will find its welcome way i have been very comfortable here listening to the d d monologue which elderly gentlemen call conversation in which my pious father-in-law repeats himself every evening save one when he played upon his fiddle however they have been vastly kind and hospitable and i like them and the place vastly and i hope they will live many happy months bell is in health and unvaried good humor and behavior but we are in all the agonies of packing and parting End quote. nine days after this under date of march seventeenth lord byron says quote, we mean to metropolize to-morrow and you will address your next to piccadilly End quote. the inference is that the days intermediate were spent at colonel lee's the next letters and all subsequent ones for six months are dated from piccadilly as we have shown there is every reason to believe that a warm friendship had thus arisen between mrs lee and lady byron and that during all this time lady byron desired as much of the society of her sister-in-law as possible she was a married woman and a mother her husband's nearest relative and lady byron could with more propriety ask from her counsel or aid in respect to his peculiarities than she could from her own parents if we consider the character of lady byron as given by mrs mims that of a young person of warm but repressed feeling without sister or brother longing for human sympathy and having so far found no relief but in talking with a faithful dependent 
we may easily see that the acquisition of a sister through lord byron might have been all in all to her and that the feelings which he checked and rejected for himself might have flowed out towards his sister with enthusiasm the date of mrs lee's visit does not appear the first domestic indication in lord byron's letters from london is the announcement of the death of lady byron's uncle lord wentworth from whom came large expectations of property lord byron had mentioned him before in his letters as so kind to bell and himself that he could not find it in his heart to wish him in heaven if he preferred staying here in his letter of april twenty third he mentions going to the play immediately after hearing this news although as he says he ought to have stayed at home in sackcloth for unc on june twelfth he writes that lady byron is more than three months advanced in her progress towards maternity and that they have been out very little as he wishes to keep her quiet we are informed by moore that lord byron was at this time a member of the drury lane theatre committee and that in this unlucky connection one of the fatalities of the first year of trial as a husband lay from the strain of byron's letters as given in moore it is apparent that while he thinks it best for his wife to remain at home he does not propose to share the retirement but prefers running his own separate career with such persons as thronged the green room of the theatre in those days in commenting on lord byron's course we must not by any means be supposed to indicate that he was doing any more or worse than most gay young men of his time the license of the day is to getting drunk at dinner parties and leading generally what would in these days be called a disorderly life was great we should infer that none of the literary men of byron's time would have been ashamed of being drunk occasionally the noctes ambrosian club of blackwood is full of songs glorying in the broadest terms in out-and-out -out drunkenness and inviting to it as the highest condition of a civilized being footnote shelton mackenzie in a note to the noctes of july eighteen twenty two gives the following saying of mcginn one of the principal lights of the club quote, no man however much he might tend to civilization was to be regarded as having absolutely reached its apex until he was drunk End quote. He also records it as a further joke of the club that a man's having reached this apex was to be tested by his inability to pronounce the word civilization, which he says after ten o'clock at night ought to be abridged to civilization by syncope or vigorously speaking by hiccup. End footnote. But drunkenness upon Lord Byron had a peculiar and specific effect which he notices afterwards in his journal at venice the effect of all wines and spirits upon me is however strange it settles but makes me gloomy gloomy at the very moment of their effect it composes however though sullenly and again in another place he says wine and spirits make me sullen and savage to ferocity it is well known that the effects of alcoholic excitement are various as the natures of the subjects but by far the worst effects and the most destructive to domestic peace are those that occur in cases where spirits instead of acting on the nerves of motion and depriving the subject of power in that direction stimulate the brain so as to produce there the ferocity the steadiness the utter deadness to compassion or conscience which characterize a madman how fearful to a sensitive young mother in the period of pregnancy might be the return of such a madman to the domestic roof nor can we account for those scenes described in lady anne bernard's letters where lord byron returned from his evening parties to try torturing experiments on his wife otherwise than by his own statement that spirits while they steadied him made him gloomy and savage to ferocity take for example this Quote, one night coming home from one of his lawless parties he saw me lady b so indignantly collected and bearing all with such a determined calmness that a rush of remorse seemed to come over him he called himself a monster and though his sister was present threw himself in agony at my feet i could not no i could not forgive him such injuries he had lost me for ever 
astonished at this return to virtue my tears i believe flowed over his face and i said byron all is forgotten never never shall you hear of it more he started up and folded his arms while he looked at me burst out into laughter what do you mean said i only a philosophical experiment that's all said he i wished to ascertain the value of your resolutions End quote. To ascribe such deliberate cruelty as this to the effect of drink upon Lord Byron is the most charitable construction that can be put upon his conduct. Yet the manners of the period were such that Lord Byron must have often come to this condition while only doing what many of his acquaintances did freely and without fear of consequences. Mr. Moore, with his usual artlessness, gives us an idea of a private supper between himself and Lord Byron we give it with our own italics as a specimen of many others quoting mr moore having taken upon me to order the repast and knowing that lord byron for the last two days had done nothing towards sustenance beyond eating a few biscuits and to appease appetite chewing mastic i desired that we should have a good supply of at least two kinds of fish my companion however confined himself to lobsters and of these finished two or three to his own share interposing sometimes a small liqueur glass of strong white brandy sometimes a tumbler of very hot water and then pure brandy again to the amount of nearly half a dozen small glasses of the latter without which alternately with the hot water he appeared to think the lobster could not be digested after this we had claret of which having dispatched two bottles between us at about four o'clock in the morning we parted as pope has thought his delicious lobster nights worth commemorating these particulars of one in which lord byron was concerned may also have some interest Quote, among other nights of the same description which i had the happiness of passing with him i remember once in returning home from some assembly at rather a late hour we saw lights in the windows of his old haunt stevens in bond street and agreed to stop there and sup on entering we found an old friend of his sir g w who joined our party and the lobsters and brandy and water being put in requisition it was as usual on such occasions broad daylight before we separated End quote. from moore's volume three page eighty three during the latter part of lady byron's pregnancy it appears from moore that byron was night after night engaged out at dinner parties in which getting drunk was considered as of course the finale as appears from the following letters letter two twenty eight from byron to mr moore terrace piccadilly october thirty first eighteen fifteen Quote, i have not been able to ascertain precisely the time of duration of the stock market but i believe it is a good time for selling out and i hope so first because i shall see you and next because i shall receive certain monies on behalf of lady b the which will materially conduce to my comfort i wanting as the duns say to make up a sum yesterday i dined out with a largish party where were sheridan and coleman harry harris of c g and his brother sir gilbert heathcote dennis Kinnaird, and others of note and notoriety like other parties of the kind it was first silent then talky then argumentative then disputatious then unintelligible then altogether -y, then inarticulate and then drunk when we had reached the last step of this glorious ladder it was difficult to get down again without stumbling and to crown all canard and i had to conduct sheridan down a damned corkscrew staircase which had certainly been constructed before the discovery of fermented liqueurs and to which no legs however crooked could possibly accommodate themselves we deposited him safe at home where his man evidently used to the business waited to receive him in the hall both he and coleman were as usual very good but i carried away much wine and the wine had previously carried away my memory so that all was hiccup and happiness for the last hour or so and i am not impregnated with any of the conversation 
perhaps you heard of a late answer of sheridan to the watchman who found him bereft of that divine particle of air called reason he the watchman found sherry in the street fuddled and bewildered and almost insensible who are you sir no answer what's your name a hiccup what's your name answer in a slow deliberate and impassive tone wilberforce is not that sherry all over and to my mind excellent poor fellow his very dregs are better than the first sprightly runnings of others my paper is full and i have a grievous headache p s lady b is in full progress next month will bring to light with the aid of juno lucina goddess of childbirth fur opum or rather opes for the last are most wanted the tenth wonder of the world gil blass being the eighth and he my son's father the ninth End quote. here we have a picture of the whole story lady byron within a month of her confinement her money being used to settle debts her husband out at a dinner party going through the usual course of such parties able to keep his legs and help sheridan downstairs and going home gloomy and savage to ferocity to his wife four days after this letter two twenty nine we find that this dinner party is not an exceptional one but one of a series for he says quote, to-day i dine with canard we are to have sheridan and coleman again and to-morrow once more at sir gilbert heathcote's afterward in venice he reviews the state of his health at this period in london and his account shows that his excesses in the vices of his times had wrought effects on his sensitive nervous organization very different from what they might on the more phlegmatic constitutions of ordinary englishmen in his journal dated venice february second eighteen twenty one lord byron says Quote, I have been considering what can be the reason why I always wake at a certain hour in the morning, and always in very bad spirits. I may say in actual despair and despondency in all respects, even of that which pleased me overnight. In about an hour or two this goes off, and I compose either to sleep again or at least to quiet. In England, five years ago, I had the same kind of hypochondria, but accompanied with so violent a thirst that I have drunk as many as fifteen bottles of soda water in one night after going to bed, and been still thirsty, calculating, however, some lost from the bursting out and effervescence and overflowing of the soda water in drawing the corks, or striking off the necks of the bottles from mere thirsty impatience. At present I have not the thirst, but the depression of spirits is no less violent End quote. from volume five page ninety six these extracts go to show what must have been the condition of the man whom lady byron was called to receive at the intervals when he came back from his various social excitements and pleasures that his nerves were exacerbated by violent extremes of abstinence and reckless indulgence that he was often day after day drunk and that drunkenness made him savage and ferocious such are the facts clearly shown by mr moore's narrative of the natural peculiarities of lord byron's temper he thus speaks to the countess of blessington Quote, i often think that i inherit my violence and bad temper from my poor mother not that my father from all i could ever learn had a much better so that it is no wonder i have such a very bad one as long as i can remember anything i recollect being subject to violent paroxysms of rage so disproportioned to the cause as to surprise me when they were over and this still continues i cannot coolly view anything which excites my feelings and once the lurking devil in me is roused i lose all command of myself i do not recover a good fit of rage for days after mind i do not by this mean that the ill-humour continues as on the contrary that quickly subsides exhausted by its own violence but it shakes me terribly and leaves me low and nervous after End quote. from lady blessington's conversations page one forty two that during this time also his irritation and ill-temper were increased by the mortification of duns debts and executions is on the face of moore's story 
Moore himself relates one incident which gives some idea of the many which may have occurred at these times in a note on page 215, volume 4, where he speaks of Lord Byron's destroying a favorite old watch that had been his companion from boyhood and gone with him to Greece. Quote, in a fit of vexation and rage brought upon him by some of these humiliating embarrassments to which he was now almost daily a prey, he furiously dashed this watch on the hearth and ground it to pieces with the poker among the ashes. End quote. It is no wonder that with a man of this kind to manage, Lady Byron should have clung to the only female companionship she could dare to trust in the case and earnestly desired to retain with her the sister who seemed more than herself to have influence over lord byron this ends chapter three part one the chronological summary of events read for you by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana Part 2, Chapter 3 of Lady Byron Vindicated, A History of the Byron Controversy by Harriet Beecher Stowe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3, Part 2, Chronological Summary of Events. The first letter given by the quarterly from Lady Byron to Mrs. Lee, without a date, evidently belongs to this period when the sisters society presented itself as a refuge in her approaching confinement mrs lee speaks of leaving the young wife conscious that the house presents no attractions and that soon she herself shall be laid by cannot urge mrs lee's stay as likely to give her any pleasure but only as a comfort to herself Quote, you will think me very foolish but i have tried two or three times and cannot talk to you of your departure with a decent visage so let me say one word in this way to spare my philosophy with the expectations which i have i never will nor can ask you to stay one moment longer than you are inclined to do it would be the worst return for all i ever received from you but in this at least i am truth itself when i say that whatever the situation may be there is no one whose society is dearer to me or can contribute more to my happiness these feelings will not change under any circumstances and i should be grieved if you did not understand them should you hereafter condemn me i shall not love you less i will say no more judge for yourself about going or staying i wish you to consider yourself if you could be wise enough to do that for the first time in your life thine a i b addressed on the cover to the honorable mrs lee this letter not being dated we have no clue but what we obtain from its own internal evidence it certainly is not written in lady byron's usual clear and elegant style and is in this respect in striking contrast to all her letters that i have ever seen but the notes written by a young woman under such peculiar and distressing circumstances must not be judged by the standard of calmer hours subsequently to this letter and during that stormy irrational period when lord byron's conduct became daily more and more unaccountable may have come that startling scene in which lord byron took every pains to convince his wife of improper relations subsisting between himself and his sister what an utter desolation this must have been to the wife tearing from her the last hold of friendship and the last refuge to which she had clung in her sorrows may easily be conceived in this crisis it appears that the sister convinced lady byron that the whole was to be attributed to insanity it would be a conviction gladly accepted and bringing infinite relief although still surrounding her path with fearful difficulties that such was the case is plainly asserted by lady byron in her statement published in eighteen thirty speaking of her separation lady byron says the facts are i left london for kirkby mallory the residence of my father and mother on the fifteenth of january eighteen sixteen lord byron had signified to me in writing january sixth his absolute desire that i should leave london on the earliest day that i could conveniently fix it was not safe for me to encounter the fatigues of a journey sooner than the fifteenth 
previously to my departure it had been strongly impressed on my mind that lord byron was under the influence of insanity this opinion was in a great measure derived from the communications made to me by his nearest relatives and personal attendant End quote now there was no nearer relative than mrs lee and the personal attendant was fletcher it was therefore presumably mrs lee who convinced lady byron of her husband's insanity lady byron says quote, it was even represented to me that he was in danger of destroying himself with the concurrence of his family i had consulted with dr bailey as a friend on january eighth as to his supposed malady End quote now lord byron's written order for her to leave came on january sixth it appears then that lady byron acting in concurrence with mrs lee and others of her husband's family consulted dr bailey on january eighth as to what she should do the symptoms presented to dr bailey being evidently insane hatred of his wife on the part of lord byron and a determination to get her out of the house lady byron goes on quote, on acquainting him with the state of the case and with lord byron's desire that i should leave london dr bailey thought my absence might be advisable as an experiment assuming the fact of mental derangement for dr bailey not having had access to lord byron could not pronounce an opinion on that point he enjoined that in correspondence with lord byron i should avoid all but light and soothing topics under these impressions i left london determined to follow the advice given me by dr bailey whatever might have been the nature of lord byron's treatment of me from the time of my marriage yet supposing him to have been in a state of mental alienation it was not for me nor for any person of common humanity to manifest at that moment a sense of injury End quote it appears then that the domestic situation in byron's house at the time of his wife's expulsion was one so grave as to call for family counsel for lady byron generally accurate speaks in the plural number his nearest relatives certainly includes mrs lee his family includes more that some of lord byron's own relatives were cognizant of facts at that time and that they took lady byron's side is shown by one of his own chance admissions in moore's volume six page three ninety four in a letter on bowls he says speaking of this time quote, all my relations save one fell from me like leaves from a tree in autumn and in medwin's conversations he says quote, even my cousin george byron who had been brought up with me and whom i loved as a brother took my wife's part End quote. the conduct must have been marked in the extreme that led to this result we cannot help stopping here to say that lady byron's situation at this time has been discussed in our days with a want of ordinary human feeling that is surprising let any father and mother reading this look on their own daughter and try to make the case their own after a few short months of married life months full of patient endurance of the strangest and most unaccountable treatment she comes to them expelled from her husband's house an object of hatred and aversion to him and having to settle for herself the awful question whether he is a dangerous madman or a determined villain such was this young wife's situation with a heart at times wrung with compassion for her husband as a helpless maniac and fearful that all may end in suicide yet compelled to leave him she writes on the road the much quoted letter beginning dear duck this is an exaggerated and unnatural letter it is true but of precisely the character that might be expected from an inexperienced young wife when dealing with a husband supposed to be insane the next day she addressed to augusta this letter quote, my dearest a it is my great comfort that you are still in piccadilly End quote. and again on the twenty-third dearest a i know you feel for me as i do for you and perhaps i am better understood than i think you have been ever since i knew you my best comforter and will so remain unless you grow tired of the office which may well be End quote. we can see here how self-denying and heroic appears to lady byron the conduct of the sister 
who patiently remains to soothe and guide and restrain the moody madman whose madness takes a form at times so repulsive to every womanly feeling she intimates that she should not wonder should augusta grow weary of the office lady byron continues her statement thus quote, when i arrived at kirkby mallory my parents were unacquainted with the existence of any causes likely to destroy my prospects of happiness and when i communicated to them the opinion that had been formed concerning lord byron's state of mind they were most anxious to promote his restoration by every means in their power they assured those relations that were with him in london that quote, they would devote their whole care and attention to the alleviation of his malady End quote. here we have a quotation from a letter written by lady milbank to the anxious relations who were taking counsel about lord byron in town footnote this little incident shows the characteristic carefulness and accuracy of lady byron's habits this statement was written fourteen years after the events spoken of but lady byron carefully quotes a passage from her mother's letter written at that time this shows that a copy of lady milbank's letter had been preserved and makes it appear probable that copies of the whole correspondence of that period were also kept great light could be thrown on the whole transaction could these documents be consulted and footnote lady byron also adds in justification of her mother from lord byron's slanders Quote, she had always treated him with an affectionate consideration and indulgence which extended to every little peculiarity of his feelings never did an irritating word escape her lips in her whole intercourse with him now comes a remarkable part of lady byron's statement Quote, the accounts given me after i left lord byron by those in constant intercourse with him added to those doubts which had before transiently occurred to my mind as to the reality of the alleged disease and the reports of his medical attendants were far from establishing anything like lunacy footnote here again lady byron's sealed papers might furnish light the letters addressed to her at this time by those in constant intercourse with lord byron are doubtless preserved and would show her ground for action End footnote. when these doubts arose in her mind it is not natural to suppose that they should at first involve mrs lee she still appears to lady byron as the devoted believing sister fully convinced of her brother's insanity and endeavouring to restrain and control him but if lord byron were sane if the purposes he had avowed to his wife were real he must have lied about his sister in the past and perhaps have the worst intentions for the future the horrors of that state of vacillation between the conviction of insanity and the commencing conviction of something worse can scarcely be told at all events the wife's doubts extend so far that she speaks out to her parents under this uncertainty says the statement i deemed it right to communicate to my parents that if i were to consider lord byron's past conduct as that of a person of sound mind nothing could induce me to return to him it therefore appeared expedient both to them and to myself to conduct the ablest advisers for that object and also to obtain still further information respecting appearances which indicated mental derangement my mother determined to go to london she was empowered by me to take legal opinion on a written statement of mine though i then had reasons for reserving a part of the case from the knowledge even of my father and mother End quote it was during this time of uncertainty that the next letter to mrs lee may be placed it seems to be rather a fragment of a letter than a whole one perhaps it is an extract in which case it would be desirable if possible to view it in connection with the remaining text january twenty fifth eighteen sixteen quote, my dearest augusta shall i still be your sister i must resign my right to be so considered but i don't think that will make any difference in the kindness i have so uniformly experienced from you this fragment is not signed nor finished in any way but indicates that the writer is about to take a decisive step 
on the seventeenth as we have seen lady milbank had written inviting lord byron subsequently she went to london to make more particular inquiries into his state this fragment seems part of a letter from lady byron called forth in view of some evidence resulting from her mother's observations footnote probably lady milbank's letters are among the sealed papers and would more fully explain the situation and footnote lady byron now adds quote, being convinced by the results of these inquiries and by the tenor of lord byron's proceedings that the notion of insanity was an illusion i no longer hesitated to authorize such measures as were necessary in order to secure me from ever being again placed in his power conformably with this resolution my father wrote to him on the second of february to request an amicable separation End quote. the following letter to mrs lee is dated the day after this application and is in many respects a noticeable one kirkby mallory february third eighteen sixteen Quote, my dearest augusta you are desired by your brother to ask if my father has acted with my concurrence in proposing a separation he has it cannot be supposed that in my present distressing situation i am capable of stating in a detailed manner the reasons which will not only justify this measure but compel me to take it and it never can be my wish to remember unnecessarily those injuries for which however deep I feel no resentment. I will now only recall to Lord Byron's mind his avowed and insurmountable aversion to the married state, and the desire and determination he has expressed ever since its commencement to free himself from that bondage, as finding it quite insupportable, though candidly acknowledging that no effect of duty or affection has been wanting on my part he has too painfully convinced me that all these attempts to contribute toward his happiness were wholly useless and most unwelcome to him i enclose this letter to my father wishing it to receive his sanction ever yours most affectionately a i byron End quote. we observe in this letter that it was written to be shown to lady byron's father and receive his sanction and as that father was in ignorance of all the deeper causes of trouble in the case it will be seen that the letter must necessarily be a reserved one this sufficiently accounts for the guarded character of the language when speaking of the causes of separation one part of the letter incidentally overthrows lord byron's statement which he always repeated during his life and which is repeated for him now namely that his wife forsook him instead of being as she claims expelled by him she recalls to lord byron's mind the desire and determination he has expressed ever since his marriage to free himself from its bondage this is in perfect keeping with the absolute desire signified by writing that she should leave his house on the earliest day possible and she places the cause of the separation on his having too painfully convinced her that he does not want her as a wife it appears that augusta hesitates to show this note to her brother it is bringing on a crisis which she above all others would most wish to avoid in the meantime lady byron receives a letter from lord byron which makes her feel it more than ever essential to make the decision final i have reason to believe that this letter is preserved in lady byron's papers february fourth eighteen sixteen quote, i hope my dear augusta that you would on no account withhold from your brother the letter which i sent yesterday in answer to yours written by his desire particularly as one which i received from himself to-day renders it still more important that he should know the contents of that addressed to you i am in haste and not very well yours most affectionately a i byron the last of this series of letters is less like the style of lady byron than any of them we cannot judge whether it is the whole consecutive letter or fragments from a letter selected and united there is a great want of that clearness and precision which usually characterized lady byron's style it shows however that the decision is made a decision which she regrets on account of the sister who has tried so long to prevent it 
Kirkby Mallory, February 14, 1816. Quote, the present sufferings of all may yet be repaid in blessings. Do not despair absolutely, dearest, and leave me but enough of your interest to afford you any consolation by partaking of that sorrow which I am most unhappy to cause thus unintentionally. You will be of my opinion hereafter, and at present your bitterest reproach would be forgiven, though heaven knows you have considered me more than a thousand would have done more than anything but my affection for b one most dear to you could deserve i must not remember these feelings farewell god bless you from the bottom of my heart a i b we are here to consider that mrs lee has stood to lady byron in all this long agony as her only confidant and friend that she has denied the charges her brother has made and referred them to insanity admitting insane attempts upon herself which she has been obliged to watch over and control lady byron has come to the conclusion that augusta is mistaken as to insanity that there is a real wicked purpose and desire on the part of the brother not as yet believed in by the sister she regards the sister as one who though deceived and blinded is still worthy of confidence and consideration and so says to her you will be of my opinion hereafter she says you have considered me more than a thousand would have done mrs lee is in lady byron's eyes a most abused and innocent woman who to spare her sister in a delicate situation has taken on herself the whole charge of a maniacal brother although suffering from him language and actions of the most injurious kind that mrs lee did not flee the house at once under such circumstances and wholly decline the management of the case seems to lady byron consideration and self-sacrifice greater than she can acknowledge the knowledge of the whole extent of the truth came to lady byron's mind at a later period we now take up the history from Lushington's letter to Lady Byron, published at the close of her statement. The application to Lord Byron for an act of separation was positively refused at first, it being an important part of his policy that all the responsibility and insistence should come from his wife, and that he should appear forced into it contrary to his will. Dr. Lushington, however, says to Lady Byron, quote, I was originally consulted by Lady Noel on your behalf while you were in the country. The circumstances detailed by her were such as justified a separation, but they were not of that aggravated description as to render such a measure indispensable. On Lady Noel's representations, I deemed a reconciliation with Lord Byron practicable and felt most sincerely a wish to aid in effecting it. There was not, on Lady Noel's part, any exaggeration of the facts, nor, so far as I could perceive, any determination to prevent a return to Lord Byron. Certainly none was expressed when I spoke of a reconciliation. In this crisis, with Lord Byron refusing the separation, with Lushington expressing a wish to aid in a reconciliation, and Lady Noel not expressing any aversion to it, the whole strain of the dreadful responsibility comes upon the wife. She resolves to ask counsel of her lawyer, in view of a statement of the whole case. Lady Byron is spoken of by Lord Byron, letter 233, as being in town with her father on the 29th of February, viz. fifteen days after the date of the last letter to Mrs. Lee. It must have been about this time, then, that she laid her whole case before Lushington, and he gave it a thorough examination. The result was that Lushington expressed, in the most decided terms, his conviction that reconciliation was impossible. The language he uses is very striking. Quote, when you came to town in about a fortnight, or perhaps more, after my first interview with Lady Noel, I was for the first time informed by you of facts utterly unknown, as I have no doubt, to Sir Ralph and Lady Noel. On receiving this additional information, my opinion was entirely changed. I considered a reconciliation impossible. I declared my opinion, and added that if such an idea should be entertained, I could not, either professionally or otherwise, take any part towards effecting it. End quote. 
it does not appear in this note what effect the lawyer's examination of the case had on lady byron's mind by the expressions he uses we should infer that she may still have been hesitating as to whether a reconciliation might not be her duty this hesitancy he does away with most decisively saying a reconciliation is impossible and supporting lady byron or her friends desirous of one he declares positively that he cannot either professionally as a lawyer or privately as a friend have anything to do with effecting it the lawyer it appears has drawn from the facts of the case inferences deeper and stronger than those which presented themselves to the mind of the young woman and he instructs her in the most absolute terms fourteen years after in eighteen thirty for the first time the world was astonished by this declaration from dr lushington in language so pronounced and positive that there could be no mistake lady byron had stood all these fourteen years slandered by her husband and misunderstood by his friends when had she so chosen this opinion of dr lushington's could have been at once made public which fully justified her conduct if as the blackwood of july insinuates the story told to lushington was a malignant slander meant to injure lord byron why did she suppress the judgment of her counsel at a time when all the world was on her side and this decision would have made the decisive blow against her husband why by sealing the lips of counsel and of all whom she could influence did she deprive herself finally of the very advantage for which it has been assumed she fabricated the story this ends chapter three the chronological summary of events Read for you by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Part 2, Chapter 4 of Lady Byron Vindicated, A History of the Byron Controversy by Harriet Beecher Stowe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4, The Character of the Two Witnesses Compared it will be observed that in this controversy we are confronting two opposing stories one of lord and the other of lady byron and the statements from each are in point-blank contradiction lord byron states that his wife deserted him lady byron states that he expelled her and reminds him in her letter to augusta lee that the expulsion was a deliberate one and that he had purposed it from the beginning of their marriage lord byron always stated that he was ignorant why his wife left him and was desirous of her return lady byron states that he told her he would force her to leave him and to leave him in such a way that the whole blame of the separation should always rest on her and not on him to say nothing of any deeper or darker accusations on either side here in the very outworks of the story the two meet point blank in considering two opposing stories we always as a matter of fact take into account the character of the witnesses if a person be literal and exact in his usual modes of speech reserved careful conscientious and in the habit of observing minutely the minor details of time place and circumstances we give weight to his testimony from these considerations but if a person be proved to have singular or exceptional principles with regard to truth if he be universally held by society to be so in the habit of mystification that large allowances must be made for his statements if his assertions at one time contradict those made at another and if his statements also sometimes come in collision with those of his best friends so that when his language is reported difficulties follow and explanations are made necessary all this certainly disqualifies him from being considered a trustworthy witness all these disqualifications belong in a remarkable degree to lord byron on the oft-repeated testimony of his best friends we shall first cite the following testimony given in an article from under the crown which is written by an early friend and ardent admirer of lord byron Quote, byron had one preeminent fault a fault which must be considered as deeply criminal by every one who does not as i do believe it to have resulted from monomania 
he had a morbid love of a bad reputation there was hardly an offence of which he would not with perfect indifference accuse himself an old schoolfellow who met him on the continent told me that he would continually write paragraphs against himself in the foreign journals and delight in their republication by the english newspapers as in the success of a practical joke whenever anybody has related anything discreditable of byron assuring me that it must be true for he heard it from himself i have always felt that he could not have spoken upon worse authority and that in all probability the tale was a pure invention if i could remember and were willing to repeat the various misdoings which i have from time to time heard him attribute to himself i could fill a volume but i never believed them i very soon became aware of this strange idiosyncrasy it puzzled me to account for it but there it was a sort of diseased and distorted vanity the same eccentric spirit would induce him to report things which were false with regard to his family which anybody else would have concealed though true he told me more than once that his father was insane and killed himself i shall never forget the manner in which he first told me this while washing his hands and singing a gay neapolitan air he stopped looked round at me and said there always was madness in the family then after continuing his washing and his song he added as if speaking of a matter of the slightest indifference my father cut his throat the contrast between the tenor of the subject and the levity of the expression was fearfully painful it was like a stanza of don juan in this instance i had no doubt that the fact was as he related it but in speaking of it only a few years since to an old lady in whom i had the perfect confidence she assured me that it was not so mr byron who was her cousin had been extremely wild but was quite sane and had died very quietly in his bed what byron's reason could have been for thus calumniating not only himself but the blood which was flowing in his veins who can divine but for some reason or other it seemed to be his determined purpose to keep himself unknown to the great body of his fellow-creatures to present himself to their view in moral masquerade End quote. certainly the character of lord byron here given by his friend is not the kind to make him a trustworthy witness in any case on the contrary it seems to show either a subtle delight in falsehood for falsehood's sake or else the wary artifices of a man who having a deadly secret to conceal employs many turnings and windings to throw the world off the scent what intriguer having a crime to cover could devise a more artful course than to send half a dozen absurd stories to the press which should after a while be traced back to himself till the public should gradually look on all it heard from him as a result of this eccentric humour the easy trifling air with which lord byron made to this friend a false statement in regard to his father would lead naturally to the inquiry on what other subjects equally important to the good name of others he might give false testimony with equal indifference when medwin's conversations with lord byron were first published they contained a number of declarations of the noble lord affecting the honour and honesty of his friend and publisher murray these appear to have been made in the same way as those about his father and with equal indifference so serious were the charges that mr murray's friends felt that he ought in justice to himself to come forward and confront them with the facts as stated in byron's letters to himself and in volume ten page one forty three of murray's standard edition accordingly these false statements are confronted with the letters of lord byron the statements as reported are of a most material and vital nature relating to murray's financial honour and honesty and to his general truthfulness and sincerity in reply murray opposes to them the accounts of sums paid for different works and letters from byron exactly contradicting his own statements as to murray's character the subject as we have seen was discussed in the noctes no doubt appears to be entertained that byron made the statements to medwin and the theory of accounting for them is that byron was bamming him 
it seems never to have occurred to any of these credulous gentlemen who laughed at others for being bammed that byron might be doing the very same thing to themselves how many of his so-called packages sent to lady byron were real packages and how many were mystifications we find in two places at least in his memoir letters to lady byron written and shown to others which he says were never sent by him he told lady blessington that he was in the habit of writing to her constantly was this bamming was he bamming also when he told the world that lady byron suddenly deserted him quite to his surprise and that he never to his dying day could find out why lady blessington relates that in one of his conversations with her he entertained her by repeating epigrams and lampoons in which many of his friends were treated with severity she inquired of him in case he should die and such proofs of his friendship come before the public what would be the feelings of these friends who had supposed themselves to stand so high in his good graces she says quote, that said byron is precisely one of the ideas that most amuses me i often fancy the rage and humiliation of my quondam friends in hearing the truth at least from me for the first time and when i am beyond the reach of their malice what grief continued byron laughing could resist the charges of ugliness dullness or any of the thousand nameless defects personal or mental that flesh is heir to when reprisal or recantation was impossible people are in such daily habits of commenting on the defects of friends that they are unconscious of the unkindness of it now i write down as well as speak my sentiments of those who think they have gulled me and i only wish in case i die before them that i might return to witness the effects my posthumous opinions of them are likely to produce in their minds what good fun this would be you don't seem to value this as you ought said byron with one of his sardonic smiles seeing i looked as i really felt surprised at his avowed insincerity i feel the same pleasure in anticipating the rage and mortification of my soi disant friends at the discovery of my real sentiments of them that a miser may be supposed to feel while making a will that will disappoint all the expectations that have been toadying him for years then how amusing it will be to compare my posthumous with my previously given opinions the one throwing ridicule on the other End quote it is asserted in a note to the noctes that byron besides his autobiography prepared a voluminous dictionary of all his friends and acquaintances in which brief notes of their persons and character were given with his opinion of them it was not considered that the publication of this would add to the noble lord's popularity and it has never appeared in hunt's life of byron there is similar testimony speaking of byron's carelessness in exposing his friends secrets and showing or giving away their letters hunt says if his five hundred confidants by a reticence as remarkable as his laxity had not kept his secrets better than he did himself the very devil might have been played with i don't know how many people but there was always this saving reflection to be made that the man who could be guilty of such extravagances for the sake of making an impression might be guilty of exaggeration or inventing what astonished you and indeed though he was a speaker of the truth on ordinary occasions that is to say he did not tell you that he had seen a dozen horses when he had seen only two yet as he professed not to value the truth when in the way of his advantage and there was nothing he thought more to his advantage than making you stare at him the persons who were liable to suffer from his inconsistency had all the right in the world to the benefit of this consideration End quote. with a person of such mental and moral habits as to truth this inquiry always must be where does mystification end and truth begin if a man is careless about his father's reputation for sanity and reports him a crazy suicide if he gaily accuses his publisher and good friend of double dealing shuffling and dishonesty if he tells stories about mrs claremont to which his sister offers a public refutation is it to be supposed that he will always tell the truth about his wife when the world is pressing him hard and every instinct of self-defence is on the alert 
and then the ingenuity that could write and publish false documents about himself that they might reappear in london papers to what other accounts might it not be turned might it not create documents invent statements about his wife as well as himself the document so ostentatiously given by m g lewis for circulation among friends in england was a specimen of what the noctis club would call bamming if byron wanted a legal investigation why did he not take it in the first place instead of signing the separation if he wanted to cancel it as he said in this document why did he not go to london and enter a suit for the restitution of conjugal rights or a suit in chancery to get possession of his daughter that this was in his mind passages in medwin's conversations show he told lady blessington also that he might claim his daughter in chancery at any time why did he not do it either of these two steps would have brought on that public investigation he so longed for can it be possible that all the friends who passed this private document from hand to hand never suspected that they were being bammed by it but it has been universally assumed that though byron was thus remarkably given to mystification yet all his statements in regard to this story are to be accepted simply because he makes them why must we accept them any more than his statements as to murray or his own father so we constantly find lord byron's incidental statements coming in collision with those of others for example in his account of his marriage he tells medwin that lady byron's maid was put between his bride and himself on the same seat in the wedding journey the lady's maid herself mrs mims says she was sent before them to hal nabby and was there to receive them when they alighted he said of lady byron's mother she always detested me and had not the decency to conceal it in her own house dining with her one day i broke a tooth and was in great pain which i could not help showing it will do you good said lady noel i am glad of it End quote lady byron says speaking of her mother she always treated him with an affectionate consideration and indulgence which extended to every little peculiarity of his feelings never did an irritating word escape her lord byron states that the correspondence between him and lady byron after his refusal was first opened by her lady byron's friends deny this statement and assert that the direct contrary is the fact thus we see that lord byron's statements are directly opposed to those of his family in relation to his father directly against murray's accounts and his own admission to murray directly against the statement of the lady's maid as to her position in the journey directly against mrs lee's as to mrs claremont and against lady byron as to her mother we can see also that these misstatements were so fully perceived by the men of his times that medwin's conversations were simply laughed at as an amusing instance of how far a man might be made the victim of a mystification christopher north thus sentences the book quote, i don't mean to call mr medwin a liar the captain lies sir but it is under a thousand mistakes whether byron bammed him or he by virtue of his own egregious stupidity was the sole and sufficient bamifier of himself i know not neither greatly do i care this much is certain that the book throughout is full of things that were not and most resplendently deficient of the things that were End quote. yet it is on medwin's conversations alone that many of the magazine assertions in regard to lady byron are founded it is on that authority that lady byron is accused of breaking open her husband's writing desk in his absence and sending the letters she found there to the husband of a lady compromised by them and likewise that lord byron is declared to have paid back his wife's ten thousand pound wedding portion and doubled it moore makes no such statements and his remarks about lord byron's use of his wife's money are unmistakable evidence to the contrary moore although byron's ardent partisan was too well informed to make assertions with regard to him which at that time would have been perfectly easy to refute all these facts go to show that lord byron's character for accuracy or veracity was not such as to entitle him to ordinary confidence as a witness especially in a case where he had the strongest motives for misstatement 
and if we consider that the celebrated autobiography was the finished careful work of such a practised mystifier who can wonder that it presented a web of such intermingled truth and lies that there was no such thing as disentangling it and pointing out where falsehood ended and truth began but in regard to lady byron what has been the universal impression of the world it has been alleged against her that she was a precise straightforward woman so accustomed to plain literal dealings that she could not understand the various mystifications of her husband and from that cause arose her unhappiness byron speaks in the sketch of her peculiar truthfulness and even in the clytemnestra poem when accusing her of lying he speaks of her as departing from the early truth that was her proper praise lady byron's careful accuracy as to dates to time place and circumstances will probably be vouched for by all the very large number of persons whom the management of her extended property and her works of benevolence brought to act as co-operators or agents with her she was not a person in the habit of making exaggerated or ill-considered statements her published statement of eighteen thirty is clear exact accurate and perfectly intelligible the dates are carefully ascertained and stated the expressions are moderate and all the assertions firm and perfectly definite it therefore seems remarkable that the whole reasoning on this byron matter has generally been conducted by assuming all lord byron's statements to be true and requiring all lady byron's statements to be sustained by other evidence if lord byron asserts that his wife deserted him the assertion is accepted without proof but if lady byron asserts that he ordered her to leave that requires proof lady byron asserts that she took counsel on this order of lord byron with his family friends and physician under the idea that it originated in insanity the blackwood asks what family friends says it doesn't know of any and asks proof if lord byron asserts that he always longed for a public investigation of the charges against him the quarterly and blackwood quote the saying with ingenuous confidence they are obliged to admit that he refused to stand that public test that he signed the deed of separation rather than meet it they know also that he could have at any time instituted suits against lady byron that would have brought the whole matter into court and that he did not why did he not the quarterly simply intimates that such suits would have been unpleasant why on account of personal delicacy the man that wrote don juan and furnished the details of his wedding night held back from clearing his name by delicacy it is astonishing to what extent this controversy has consisted in simply repeating lord byron's assertions over and over again and calling the result proof now we propose a different course as lady byron is not stated by her warm admirers to have had any monomania for speaking untruths on the subject we rank her value as a witness at a higher rate than lord byron's she never accused her parents of madness or suicide merely to make a sensation never bammed an acquaintance by false statements concerning the commercial honor of any one with whom she was in business relations never wrote and sent to the press as a clever jest false statements about herself and never in any other ingenious way tampered with truth we therefore hold it to be a mere dictate of reason and common sense that in all cases where her statements conflict with her husband's hers are to be taken as the more trustworthy the london quarterly in a late article distinctly repudiates lady byron's statements as sources of evidence and throughout quotes statements of lord byron as if they had the force of self-evident propositions we consider such a course contrary to common sense as well as common good manners the state of the case is just this if lord byron did not make false statements on this subject it was certainly an exception to his usual course he certainly did make such on a great variety of other subjects by his own showing he had a peculiar pleasure in falsifying language and in misleading and betraying even his friends but if lady byron gave false witness upon this subject it was an exception to the whole course of her life 
the habits of her mind the government of her conduct her lifelong reputation all were those of a literal exact truthfulness the accusation of her being untruthful was first brought forward by her husband in the clytemnestra poem in the autumn of eighteen sixteen but it never was publicly circulated till after his death and it was first formally made the basis of a published attack on lady byron in the july blackwood of eighteen sixty nine up to that time we look in vain through current literature for any indications that the world regarded lady byron otherwise than as a cold careful prudent woman who made no assertions and had no confidants when she spoke in eighteen thirty it is perfectly evident that christopher north and his circle believed what she said though reproving her for saying it at all the quarterly goes on to heap up a number of vague assertions that lady byron about the time of her separation made a confidant of a young officer that she told the clergyman of ham of some trials with lord ockham and that she told stories of different things at different times all this is not proof it is mere assertion and assertion made to produce prejudice it is like raising a whirlwind of sand to blind the eyes that are looking for landmarks it is quite probable lady byron told different stories about lord byron at various times no woman could have a greater variety of stories to tell and no woman ever was so persecuted and pursued and harassed both by public literature and private friendship to say something she had plenty of causes for a separation without the fatal and final one in her conversations with lady anne bernard for example she gives reasons enough for a separation though none of them are the chief one it is not different stories but contradictory stories that must be relied on to disprove the credibility of a witness the quarterly has certainly told a great number of different stories stories which may prove as irreconcilable with each other as any attributed to lady byron but its denial of all weight to her testimony is simply begging the whole question under consideration a man gives testimony about the causes of a railroad accident being the only eye-witness the opposing counsel begs whatever else you do you will not admit that man's testimony you ask why has he ever been accused of want of veracity on other subjects no he has stood high as a man of probity and honor for years why then throw out his testimony because he lies in this instance says the adversary the testimony does not agree with this and that pardon me that is the very point in question say you we expect to prove that it does agree with this and that because certain letters of lady byron's do not agree with the quarterly's theory of the facts of the separation it at once assumes that she is an untruthful witness and proposes to throw out her evidence altogether we propose on the contrary to regard lady byron's evidence with all the attention due to the statement of a high-minded conscientious person never in any other case accused of violation of truth we also propose to show it to be in strict agreement with all well-authenticated facts and documents and we propose to treat lord byron's evidence as that of a man of great subtlety versed in mystification and delighting in it and who on many other subjects not only deceived but gloried in deception and then we propose to show that it contradicts well-established facts and received documents one thing more we have to say concerning the laws of evidence in regard to documents presented in this investigation this is not a london west end affair but a grave historical inquiry in which the whole english-speaking world are interested to know the truth as it is now too late to have the securities of a legal trial certainly the rules of historical evidence should be strictly observed all important documents should be presented in an entire state with a plain and open account of their history who had them where they were found and how preserved there have been most excellent credible and authentic documents produced in this case and as a specimen of them we shall mention lord lindsay's letter and the journal and letter it authenticates lord lindsay at once comes forward gives his name boldly gives the history of the papers he produces shows how they came to be in his hands why never produced before and why now we feel confidence at once 
but in regard to the important series of letters presented as lady byron's this obviously proper course has not been pursued though assumed to be of the most critical importance no such distinct history of them was given in the first instance the want of such evidence being noticed by other papers the quarterly appears hurt that the high character of the magazine has not been a sufficient guarantee and still deals in vague statements that the letters have been freely circulated and that two noblemen of the highest character would vouch for them if necessary in our view it is necessary these noblemen should imitate lord lindsay's example give a fair account of these letters under their own names and then we would add it is needful for complete satisfaction to have the letters entire and not in fragments the quarterly gave these letters with the evident implication that they are entirely destructive to lady byron's character as a witness now has that magazine much reason to be hurt at even an insinuation on its own character when making such deadly assaults on that of another the individuals who bring forth documents that they suppose to be deadly to the character of a noble person always in her generation held to be eminent for virtue certainly should not murmur at being called upon to substantiate these documents in the manner usually expected in historical investigation we have shown that these letters do not contradict but that they perfectly confirm the facts and agree with the dates in lady byron's published statements of eighteen thirty and this is our reason for deeming them authentic these considerations with regard to the manner of conducting the inquiry seem so obviously proper that we cannot but believe that they will command a serious attention this ends part two chapter four the character of the two witnesses compared read for you by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana part two chapter five of lady byron vindicated a history of the byron controversy by harriet beecher stowe this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five the direct argument to prove the crime part one of two we shall now proceed to state the argument against lord byron first there is direct evidence that lord byron was guilty of some unusual immorality the evidence is not as the blackwood says that lushington yielded assent to the ex parte statement of a client nor as the quarterly intimates that he was affected by the charms of an attractive young woman the first evidence of it is the fact that lushington and romilly offered to take the case into court and make there a public exhibition of the proofs on which their convictions were founded second it is very strong evidence of this fact that lord byron while loudly declaring that he wished to know with what he was charged declined this open investigation and rather than meet it signed a paper which he had before refused to sign third it is also strong evidence of this fact that although secretly declaring to all his intimate friends that he still wished open investigation in a court of justice and affirming his belief that his character was being ruined for want of it he never afterwards took the means to get it instead of writing a private handbill he might have come to england and entered a suit and he did not do it that lord byron was conscious of a great crime is further made probable by the peculiar malice he seemed to bear to his wife's legal counsel if there had been nothing to fear in that legal investigation wherewith they threatened him why did he not only flee from it but regard with a peculiar bitterness those who advised and proposed it to an innocent man falsely accused the certainties of law are a blessing and a refuge female charms cannot mislead in a court of justice and the atrocities of rumour are there sifted and deprived of power a trial is not a threat to an innocent man it is an invitation an opportunity why then did he hate sir samuel romilly so that he exulted like a fiend over his tragical death the letter in which he pours forth this malignity was so brutal that moore was obliged by the general outcry of society to suppress it 
is this the language of an innocent man who has been offered a fair trial under his country's laws or of a guilty man to whom the very idea of public trial means public exposure fourth it is probable that the crime was the one now alleged because that was the most important crime charged against him by rumor at the period this appears by the following extract of a letter from shelley furnished by the quarterly dated bath september twenty ninth eighteen sixteen Quote, i saw kennard and had a long talk with him he informed me that lady byron was now in perfect health that she was living with your sister i felt much pleasure from this intelligence i consider the latter part of it as affording a decisive contradiction to the only important calumny that ever was advanced against you on this ground at least it will become the world hereafter to be silent End quote it appears evident here that the charge of improper intimacy with his sister was in the mind of shelley the only important one that had yet been made against lord byron it is fairly inferable from lord byron's own statements that his family friends believed this charge lady byron speaks in her statement of nearest relatives and family friends who were cognizant of lord byron's strange conduct at the time of the separation and lord byron in the letter to bowles before quoted says that every one of his relations except his sister fell from him in this crisis like leaves from a tree in autumn there was therefore not only this report but such appearances in support of it as convinced those nearest to the scene and best apprised of the facts so that they fell from him entirely notwithstanding the strong influence of family feeling the guiccioli book also mentions this same allegation as having arisen from peculiarities in lord byron's manner of treating his sister Quote, this deep fraternal affection assumed at times under the influence of his powerful genius and under exceptional circumstances an almost too passionate expression which opened a fresh field to his enemies End quote it appears then that there was nothing in the character of lord byron and of his sister as they appeared before their generation that prevented such a report from arising on the contrary there was something in their relations that made it seem probable and it appears that his own family friends were so affected by it that they with one accord deserted him the quarterly presents the fact that lady byron went to visit mrs lee at this time as triumphant proof that she did not then believe it can the quarterly show just what lady byron's state of mind was or what her motives were in making that visit the quarterly seems to assume that no woman without gross hypocrisy can stand by a sister proven to have been guilty we can appeal on this subject to all women we fearlessly ask any wife supposing your husband and sister were involved together in an infamous crime and that you were the mother of a young daughter whose life would be tainted by a knowledge of that crime what would be your wish would you wish to proclaim it forthwith or would you wish quietly to separate from your husband and to cover the crime from the eye of man it has been proved that lady byron did not reveal this even to her nearest relatives it is proved that she sealed the mouths of her counsel and even of servants so effectually that they remain sealed even to this day this is evidence that she did not wish the thing known it is proved also that in spite of her secrecy with her parents and friends the rumor got out and was spoken of by shelley as the only important one now let us see how this note cited by the quarterly confirms one of lady byron's own statements she says to lady anne bernard quote, i trust you understand my wishes which never were to injure lord byron in any way for though he would not suffer me to remain his wife he cannot prevent me from continuing his friend and it was from considering myself as such that i silenced the accusations by which my own conduct might have been more fully justified end quote. how did lady byron silence accusations first by keeping silence to her nearest relatives 
second by shutting the mouths of servants third by imposing silence on her friends as lady anne bernard fourth by silencing her legal counsel fifth and most entirely by treating mrs lee before the world with unaltered kindness in the midst of the rumours lady byron went to visit her and shelley says that the movement was effectual can the quarterly prove that at this time mrs lee had not confessed all and thrown herself on lady byron's mercy it is not necessary to suppose great horror and indignation on the part of lady byron she may have regarded her sister as the victim of a most singularly powerful temper lord byron as she knew had tried to corrupt her own morals and faith he had obtained a power over some women even in the highest circles in england which had led them to forgo the usual decorums of their sex and had given rise to great scandals he was a being of wonderful personal attractions he had not only strong poetical but also strong logical power he was daring in speculation and vigorous in sophistical argument beautiful dazzling and possessed of magnetic power of fascination his sister had been kind and considerate to lady byron when lord byron was brutal and cruel she had been overcome by him as a weaker nature sometimes sinks under the force of a stronger one and lady byron may really have considered her to be more sinned against than sinning lord byron if we look at it rightly did not corrupt his sister mrs lee any more than he did the whole british public they rebelled at the immorality of his conduct and the obscenity of his writings and he resolved that they should accept both and he made them do it at first they execrated don juan murray was afraid to publish it women were determined not to read it in eighteen nineteen dr william mcginn of the noctes wrote a song against it in the following virtuous strain be one then unseen unknown it must or we shall rue it we may have virtue of our own ah why should we undo it the treasured faith of days long past we still would prize o'er any and grieve to hear the ribald jeer of scamps like don giovanni lord byron determined to conquer the virtuous scruples of the noctes club and so we find this same dr william mcginn who in eighteen nineteen wrote so valiantly in eighteen twenty two declaring that he would rather have written a page of don juan than a ton of child harold all english morals were in like manner formally surrendered to lord byron more details his adulteries in venice with unabashed particularity artists send for pictures of his principal mistresses the literary world call for biographical sketches of their points more compares his wife and his last mistress in a neatly tuned sentence and yet the professor of morals in edinburgh university recommends the biography as pure and having no mud in it the mistress is lionized in london and in eighteen sixty nine is introduced to the world of letters by blackwood and bid without a blush to say she loved this much being done to all england it is quite possible that a woman like lady byron standing silently aside and surveying the course of things may have thought that mrs lee was no more seduced than all the rest of the world and have said as we feel disposed to say of that generation and of a good many in this let him that is without sin among you cast the first stone the peculiar bitterness of remorse expressed in his works by lord byron is a further evidence that he had committed an unusual crime we are aware that evidence cannot be drawn in this manner from an author's works merely if unsupported by any external probability for example the subject most frequently and powerfully treated by hawthorne is the influence of a secret unconfessed crime on the soul nevertheless as hawthorne is well known to have always lived a pure and regular life nobody has ever suspected him of any greater sin than a vigorous imagination but here is a man believed guilty of an uncommon immorality by the two best lawyers in england and threatened with an open exposure which he does not dare to meet 
the crime is named in society his own relations fall away from him on account of it it is only set at rest by the heroic conduct of his wife now this man is stated by many of his friends to have had all the appearance of a man secretly laboring under the consciousness of crime moore speaks of this propensity in the following language Quote, i have known him more than once as we sat together after dinner and he was a little under the influence of wine to fall seriously into this dark self-accusing mood and throw out hints of his past life with an air of gloom and mystery designed evidently to awaken curiosity and interest End quote moore says that it was his own custom to dispel these appearances by ridicule to which his friend was keenly alive and he goes on to say quote, it has sometimes occurred to me that the occult causes of his lady's separation from him round which herself and her legal advisers have thrown such formidable mystery may have been nothing more than some imposture of this kind some dimly hinted confession of undefined horror which though intended by the relator to mystify and surprise the hearer so little understood as to take in sober seriousness End quote. all we have to say is that lord byron's conduct in this respect is exactly what might have been expected if he had a crime on his conscience the energy of remorse and despair expressed in manfred were so appalling and so vividly personal that the belief was universal on the continent that the experience was wrought out of some actual crime goethe expressed this idea and had heard a murder imputed to byron as the cause the allusion to the crime and consequences of incest is so plain in manfred that it is astonishing that any one can pretend as galt does that it had any other application the hero speaks of the love between himself and the imaginary being whose spirit haunts him as having been the deadliest sin and one that has perhaps caused her eternal destruction what is she now a sufferer for my sins a thing i dare not think upon he speaks of her blood as haunting him and as being my blood the pure warm stream that ran in the veins of my fathers and in ours when we were in our youth and had one heart and loved each other as we should not love this work was conceived in the commotion of mind immediately following his separation the scenery of it was sketched in a journal sent to his sister at the time in letter three seventy seven defending the originality of the conception and showing that it did not arise from reading faust byron says it was the steinbach and the jungfrau and something else more than faustus that made me write manfred in letter 288 speaking of the various accounts given by critics of the origin of the story he says the conjurer is out and knows nothing of the matter i had a better origin than he could devise or divine for the soul of him in letter 299 he says as to the germs of manfred they may be found in the journal i sent to mrs lee part of which you saw it may be said plausibly that lord byron if conscious of this crime would not have expressed it in his poetry but his nature was such that he could not help it whatever he wrote that had any real power was generally wrought out of self and when in a tumult of emotion he could not help giving glimpses of the cause it appears that he did know he had been accused of incest and that shelley thought that accusation the only really important one and yet sensitive as he was to blame and reprobation he ran upon this very subject most likely to reawaken scandal but lord byron's strategy was always of the bold kind it was the plan of the fugitive who instead of running away stations himself so near to danger that nobody would ever think of looking for him there he published passionate verses to his sister on this principle he imitated the security of an innocent man in everything but the unconscious energy of the agony which seized him when he gave vent to his nature in poetry the boldness of his strategy is evident through all his life he began by charging his wife with the very cruelty and deception which he was himself practising 
he had spread a net for her feet he accused her of spreading a net for his he had placed her in a position where she could not speak and then leisurely shot arrows at her and he represented her as having done the same to him when he attacked her in don juan and strove to take from her the very protection of womanly sacredness by putting her name in the mouth of every ribald he did a bold thing and he knew it the reader is here referred to the remarks of blackwood on don juan in part three of this book he meant to do a bold thing there was a general outcry against it and he fought it down and gained his point by sheer boldness and perseverance he turned the public from his wife and to himself in the face of their very groans and protests his manfred and his cane were parts of the same game but the involuntary cry of remorse and despair pierced even through his own artifices in a manner that produced a conviction of reality his evident fear and hatred of his wife were other symptoms of crime there was no apparent occasion for him to hate her he admitted that she had been bright amiable good agreeable that her marriage had been a very uncomfortable one and he said to madame de stal that he did not doubt she thought him deranged why then did he hate her for wanting to live peaceably by herself why did he so fear her that not one year of his life passed without his concocting and circulating some public or private accusation against her she by his own showing published none against him it is remarkable that in all his zeal to represent himself injured he nowhere quotes a single remark from lady byron nor a story coming either directly or indirectly from her or her family he is in a fever in venice not from what she has spoken but because she has sealed the lips of her counsel and because she and her family do not speak so that he professes himself utterly ignorant what form her allegations against him may take he had heard from shelley that his wife silenced the most important calumny by going to make mrs lee a visit and yet he is afraid of her so afraid that he tells more he expects she will attack him after death and charges him to defend his grave now if lord byron knew that his wife had a deadly secret that she could tell all this conduct is explicable it is in the ordinary course of human nature men always distrust those who hold facts by which they can be ruined they fear them they are antagonistic to them they cannot trust them the feeling of falkland to caleb williams as portrayed in godwin's masterly sketch is perfectly natural and it is exactly illustrative of what byron felt for his wife he hated her for having his secret and so far as a human being could do it he tried to destroy her character before the world that she might not have the power to testify against him if we admit this solution byron's conduct is at least that of a man who is acting as men ordinarily would act under such circumstances if we do not he is acting like a fiend let us look at admitted facts he married his wife without love in a gloomy melancholy morose state of mind the servants testified to strange unaccountable treatment of her immediately after marriage such that her confidential maid advises her to return to her parents in lady byron's letter to mrs lee she reminds lord byron that he always expressed a desire and determination to free himself from the marriage lord byron himself admits to madame de stal that his behavior was such that his wife must have thought him insane now we are asked to believe that simply because under these circumstances lady byron wished to live separate from her husband he hated and feared her so that he could never let her alone afterwards that he charged her with malice slander deceit and deadly intentions against himself merely out of spite because she preferred not to live with him this last view of the case certainly makes lord byron more unaccountably wicked than the other the first supposition shows him to us as a man in an agony of self-preservation the second as a fiend delighting in gratuitous deceit and cruelty 
again a presumption of this crime appears in lord byron's admission in a letter to moore that he had an illegitimate child born before he left england and still living at the time in letter three o seven to mr moore under date venice february second eighteen eighteen byron says speaking of moore's loss of a child quote, i know how to feel with you because i am quite wrapped up in my own children besides my little legitimate i have made unto myself an illegitimate since Ida's birth to say nothing of one before and i look forward to one of these as the pillar of my old age supposing that i ever reach as i hope i never shall that desolating period the illegitimate child that he had made to himself since Ida's birth was allegra born about nine or ten months after the separation the other illegitimate alluded to was born before and as the reader sees was spoken of as still living moore appears to be puzzled to know who this child can be and conjectures it may possibly be the child referred to in an early poem written while a schoolboy of nineteen at harrow on turning back to the note referred to we find two things first that the child there mentioned was not claimed by lord byron as his own but that he asked his mother to care for it as belonging to a schoolmate now dead second that the infant died shortly after and consequently could not be the child mentioned in this letter now besides this fact that lord byron admitted a living illegitimate child born after ada we place this other fact that there was a child in england which was believed to be his by those who had every opportunity of knowing on this subject we shall cite a passage from a letter recently received by us from england and written by a person who appears well informed on the subject of his letter Quote, the fact is the incest was first committed and the child of it born before shortly before the byron marriage the child a daughter must not be confounded with the natural daughter of lord byron born about a year after his separation the history more or less of that child of incest is known to many for in lady byron's attempts to watch over her and rescue her from ruin she was compelled to employ various agents at different times End quote. this letter contains a full recognition by an intelligent person in england of a child corresponding well with lord byron's declaration of an illegitimate born before he left england up to this point we have then the circumstantial evidence against lord byron as follows a good and amiable woman who had married him from love determined to separate from him two of the greatest lawyers in england confirmed her in this decision and threatened lord byron that unless he consented to this they would expose the evidence against him in a suit for divorce he fled from this exposure and never afterwards sought public investigation he was angry with and malicious towards the counsel who supported his wife he was angry at and afraid of a wife who did nothing to injure him and he made it a special object to defame and degrade her he gave such evidence of remorse and fear in his writings as to lead eminent literary men to believe he had committed a great crime the public rumor of his day specified what the crime was his relations by his own showing joined against him the report was silenced by his wife's efforts only lord byron subsequently declares the existence of an illegitimate child born before he left england corresponding to this there is the history known in england of a child believed to be his in whom his wife took an interest all these presumptions exist independently of any direct testimony from lady byron they are to be admitted as true whether she says a word one way or the other this ends chapter five the direct argument to prove the crime part one of two Read for you by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana.